voice of God. How to hear the voice of God, part two. And probably today we're still going to get to speak. Maybe finish up on the foundation side of it, but remember we were back in Genesis and here's Adam and Eve and they had just sinned and this is so important because some people think well you got to be so holy or whatever to hear. They had just sinned. They had just failed. They had just brought the entire universe in, under the reign of sin and death. And yet, at the same time, God desires conversation with them. And He comes, and they know the difference between God's voice and the voice of the snake. Now, how many people in the church world today know the difference? Most people in the church world is, I wonder, is that God? I wonder, is God speaking to me? I wonder, I wish God would just speak to me. And I know because I did it. I'm not pointing a finger at anybody. I'm like, God, is that you? Is that you? I mean, how do I know? So, I, so what I'm saying is I don't know the difference between my own voice, God's voice, and the voice of the, of the snake. But now in a normal relationship, you can blindfold me. And I can tell you if it's Morgan talking to me, or if it's Zach talking to me, or if it's Stevie talking to me. Why? Because we got a relationship. Oh. <laughs> but you know, they call me on the phone. I know right away. I know who it is. Don't have to. They know my voice. So they knew the difference. What was the witness of, of Abel and his sacrifice? How did he know it was accepted? And then how did Cain know that his wasn't accepted? I mean, I just want you to think about this. I mean, here's Cain. His, his, his offering isn't accepted. I would have thought if God's going to talk to you, man, at least you got to have the right offering. You ever think about that? At least you got to be doing something right for God to talk to you. God's talking to Cain, and Cain brought the wrong sacrifice. This is how much God wants conversation. And, and he comes, and the Lord said to Cain, Why are you wrong? Why are you upset? Why is, why, are you, why is your counts falling? Why do you look so sad? And then you know Cain, he goes out, talks with his brother Abel, kills him. Now here's Cain. Just brought the wrong sacrifice. God talks to him. Now he goes out and kills his brother. You would think, this is it, Cain. God ain't talking. No more. But God still comes to him again and says, Cain, where's your brother? I mean, can you imagine that? Still desiring to have conversation. This long suffering, this longing, this yearning, even for Cain, who just murdered his brother. God spoke to him. We are made to hear the voice of God, but yet we blocked it out. We blocked him off. We tried to kill the faculties, but, but it's there because even an unconverted person, that's how you hear. How can you hear except that they send a preacher? How can he preach except to be sent? How does faith come? Faith comes by hearing. So even in the unconverted person, the faculty is still there ready to hear. Because you all heard at some point in time, you heard the gospel and you answered its call and you came. So it's, it's there. And this sets up the whole of scripture. They heard God speak. I mean, it's a given. You ever read the prophets and the, and the word of the Lord came to them? God said, and I mean, it was they heard the word of the Lord. This is old covenant. It's old covenant. But what we call faith is people who made a positive response to that voice. They believed that voice and they acted upon that voice. They knew it was the voice of God and they heeded that voice. 
Noah builds an ark. Why? Because God said, build me an ark. He didn't put out fleece. You, you know what I mean? He knew the voice of God. I said, build me an ark. I said, Noah, build him an ark. Abraham, leave the land of the Ur of Chaldees. Abraham was a pagan worshiper. And God, yet God came to him in the middle of that. We think he was holy. He wasn't holy. Moses leaves the court of Pharaoh. Oh, why? Because they heard the voice of God. And you know what I find odd in the Bible, unusual? Never once was it looked upon as being unusual. Ah, oh, Abraham, you didn't hear God. Noah, you silly rabbit. Cain, that guy. You know what I mean? Never once was it looked upon as unusual. They wouldn't make fun of him. I mean, they would know. He's a prophet. He's a prophet. They might have made fun of him like we were talking about earlier, but they knew he was a prophet. He hears from God. People knew what they were talking about. And if it wasn't a voice, it was in dreams or it was in visions. Like Joseph. And I used to think, and, and I have oh, I battle with it sometimes, I used to think these people were special. You know what I mean? You ever think that? Oh, they're special. I'm a nobody. I battle with that myself. I battle with it. I'm a nobody. I'm a nothing. I'm not a, I'm not a Moses. Well, they were just men. They were just men. Now, now here's a here's a verse that, that God said to Moses to give to the people. Deuteronomy 8, 3. Now listen to this verse, and you'll know when I get to the point. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger, fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know that he might make thee know that man doeth not live by bread alone. Now man doesn't live by bread alone. So how does man live? But by every word that what? Proceedeth. That's ever ongoing. Proceedeth. Not proceeded way back then. Proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord does man live. There's more to that than feeding your body. You gotta feed your essential soul. And the only food that your essential soul craves is the voice of God's love that wants to communicate that love with you, converse with you. Remember, the little boy, Hannah's little boy, little Samuel? Little Samuel? Wakes up in the middle of the night, hears a voice, Samuel, Samuel! He gets up in the middle of the night, he runs to Eli. You call? Eli, the high priest, that was his boss. You know, he runs to Eli, what do you want? What do you want? Here I am. Eli says, I didn't holler for you. Go back, lay down. A few minutes later, Samuel, Samuel, he gets up again, runs in. You called, you called. Even Eli, Eli was nobody special. He was filling the high priest office, but we don't read no great accolades from Eli. Eli, just an old heavy man, <laughs> sat on the high priest seat, all he was. He's even called the old man. But yet he knew, he tells Samuel, it's God speaking with you. He didn't say, oh, go lay back down, Samuel. Oh, you're hearing voices. Don't worry about it. You lost your mind. He said, God is... I mean, today, if this happens, we'll send Samuel to counsel. you <coughs> hear voices. We'll send him to counsel. Because, you know, he's hearing voices. And it's interesting that Eli didn't hear. You, you know that? Eli didn't hear. But Samuel did. And Eli told him it was the voice of God. And, and later on, there's a little verse, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 9.
just a little verse here. Verse 15. Now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear a day before Saul came. You know, you know what he said right there? Because Samuel explained how God spoke to him. He said, he told me in my ear, and if you'll go and look that up, what it really means is that, I mean, if I tell you something in your ear, that means I'm whispering to you. He says, God whispered in my ear. That's how I knew. God whispered in my ear. So Samuel said, I have this conversation with God. I whisper to him and he whispers to me. I mean, isn't that neat? I mean, this is old covenant prophet. You ever, I don't know how you read the Bible, but just think he had a relationship in an old covenant with God where God got so close that he whispered in his ear that, that Eli, I sleeping right there, couldn't even hear him. I don't know if, you, if it excites you when you're reading the Bible that way, but it does me. And that's old covenant. That's old covenant. And, and to give us a glimpse of the new covenant, I know you don't ever hear this with Moses, but how did God speak to Moses? Oh, Lord, he didn't whisper in his ear. He spoke to him face to face. Can you imagine that? I mean, do you ever just wonder that conversation, God face to face? And that amazing. I can't, my mind just can't hardly even grasp it. Moses is just a man of like passions just like we are, face to face. Isaiah chapter 6, you remember that? I mean, the, the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. Here's Isaiah, and his ear begins to hear a conversation in the heavens. He begins to hear the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit talking with one another. And they're talking, and, he, and he's listening in, and, and the Father says, well... Who can I see it? Who'll go for us? Who'll go for us? And lo and behold, he jumps in the middle of the conversation. Here I am, Lord, send me. And here's the funny thing about it. They didn't ignore Isaiah. He didn't say, Isaiah, no, disqualified. We don't want you. You're too young. We want somebody better. He said, yeah, it's a good idea. Yeah, we'll send you, Isaiah. I'm going to tell you how it's going to be when you go. They're not going to hear what you got to say. and the, You know, they're going to be hard-hearted and all this stuff. But yeah, we, we agree with you. I say, it'd be a good idea. You go for us. Here's the words that I want you to tell them. Divine conversation. I mean, Isaiah has got the capability of hearing. about Psalm 25. Psalm 25. Verse 14. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear Him, and He will show them His coming. The secret. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear Him. He will show them His coming. Secret, that, that word means bringing two heads together and, and whispering in the ear. It, it's, it's the word, the Latin word here would be conspire. You know, like I can't really hear, but I know y'all two over there talking about something. Y'all are conspiring. That's where we get the Latin word. But the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. What he's saying right here, we're whispering, it gives you the picture of we're whispering secrets to each other. You know, I'm amazed at these conversations that, that go on. I, I love it when God is going to go down to Sodom and Gomorrah and he says, you know, before I go, i got to go talk to friend Abraham. I don't know how you read that, but when I get that, I'm like, i got to go talk to Abraham here, see what he thinks about I mean, this is God, and He longs to have this conversation with us. You and me, little, little old us, little old nothings, I say, as far as the world concerns, but the apple of His eye, as far as God is concerned. You're not a nothing. You were bought with a price. And He longs to have this conversation. He longs to whisper in your ear. 
longs to have you whisper in his ear. And you know, secrets is something, I, I mean, when you're telling secrets with somebody, you know, this is intimate stuff. It's intimate stuff. And you know the thing about it, and I don't know about you, but there's a, there's a lot of things that, that I'm thinking, man, I hope God don't find out. You ever think that? I hope God don't find that out. Stupid thoughts come in your head, or you know, just you messed up real bad or something. Yo, yeah, man, he was with you when you messed up. You know what I mean? He was there, and he made you with his own fingers, and he knows all about you. And I, I'm, I don't want to get into Romans 7 and 8, but I will say this. Every weakness you've got, he gave you. He made you that way. And there was a reason. So you can learn to live on him. Yeah. I can remember one time, I just shared this with you. I remember walking in my praying. I was like, Lord, I wish you would make me bold. You know? The Lord said, I'll never make you bold. I'll never make you bold. You'll learn to live from my boldness. You know what I mean? I mean, that was. This is, you know what we were doing? We were having a conversation. I was whispering in his ear of my shortcomings and my failings and my, my longings. And, you know, oh, Lord, if I just had this, I would be, you know what I mean? Lord, if I just, if you would just come in and change this part of it, Lord, said, I ain't changing nothing. It, 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 listen, we don't live the changed life. We live the exchanged life. You know, last week we were talking about last Wednesday, the garments of praise. I give him my heaviness. He gives me his garments of praise. So it's an exchange. He doesn't say, oh, Patty, I'm going to change you. Uh -uh. He made you the way you are so that you would learn to live by him. How good is that? That'll be on tape, hopefully. It'll be broadcast all over the world. Yeah. Proverbs, Proverbs 3 and 5, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. Now you, now you know here these it was things were written as a letter, but we went through and separated them all. So the ongoing, because you don't start sentences with prepositional phrases and all this other stuff. In all thy ways acknowledge him. So it would read, trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not on thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. What he's saying right here, this, this, this preacher of wisdom here, he's saying don't go the way of the fall. The way of the fall was they leaned on their own rationale, their own understanding, their own reasonings. But live in the acknowledgement. Live in the listening of Him and He will direct all thy paths. And you know, all these prophets here, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Daniel, Amos, and yeah, all of them, the word of the Lord came to them, almost a, a personal word coming and, and laying hold on them. The word of, I mean, they would say, the word of the Lord came unto me. I don't know how you, the word of the Lord came unto me. I mean, this is a personal thing. Now, we know that Jesus is the final word of God. And I say the final word of God. That is his eternal title is the word of God. He's the outspeaking of God. He's the explainer in his very person of, of the Trinity. He's the explainer in his very person of the purposes of God for, for us and in salvation. That's, that's who he is. And I've heard that just as I've heard with, with healings and all, all of those things that that Jesus coming, the final word of God sort of stopped the conversation. 
Now, if that's the case, and I don't know about you, but I have to check myself here. If that's the case, I'm envious of Ezekiel. I mean, ain't you? I mean, wouldn't you want to have that vision of the temple? I mean, come on. I saw water that couldn't be passed over. I mean, don't you want to? I saw a valley of dry bones. Don't you want to have the vision that Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up? These are old covenants. So people think, man, so we're envious of the old covenant people. Envious. And then Jesus says, it's better for you if I go away. Now hang on just a second here. How in the world could he say, it's better for you if I go away? If I don't go away, the Holy Spirit won't come. But if I go away, I'll send you another comforter. See, Jesus didn't stop the conversation. He took the conversation to its intended level, if you will, to what it was supposed to be about all the time, to the highest level, the level that, that level that you and I were created for. Because Jesus said, it is better for you. That, that word is the strongest word, the, the word better there in the Greek that they could use. It, it means it's your uh, supreme advantage. Supreme advantage. I mean, I mean, Jesus is talking to his friends. He, he's not just talking to anybody. He's talking to his best friends. I mean, this, this conversation takes place in the upper room. Hey, just twelve of them there. Judas probably already. Judas has already went out. So he just there's twelve total, eleven disciples of Jesus. And Jesus says, "I mean, this is to your supreme advantage." Then I go away. I mean, if he would have said, all right, guys, I'm leaving. I'm going to the cross, and I'm going to be ascended, and you'll never hear from me again. This would be a somber meeting. This would be Jesus saying goodbye. You'll never see me again. It's over, guys. Hang on till I come back. Three or four thousand years left. Right? I mean, it would be terrible. But he says, this is the best thing. I mean, to me, that's, it doesn't make common sense to me. You know, I mean, because i got to put myself in their position. They never heard of this Holy Spirit. They just been worshiping God, Jehovah, and then Jehovah Nissi, and all the other names. They didn't know, well, Holy Spirit, what are you talking about? I mean, But to them, I, 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 they were starting to get a little bit of the picture, maybe just a little bit, but it meant that God has become flesh. This is, this is what it means to us here, us looking back at that statement, Jesus, it's better for you that I go away. The Holy Spirit will come. It meant that God has become flesh and lives among us, and he's now, in his ascension, is going to send the Holy Spirit, who will be the very presence of the ascended Jesus, who will continue to speak to us, even as Jesus spoke to them after his resurrection. I mean, this very thing is described as eternal life. This is eternal life. Ask church people today, what is eternal life? Well, that's living forever. But Jesus says, this is eternal life. That you might know thee, the only true God, and His Son, Jesus, who be sent. I mean, if I was to say something, you know, like, this is a Bible, then you could look and say, oh, well, I've never seen a Bible before. Okay, let's see what it's all about. Jesus says, this is eternal life that you might know thee. <coughs> you might know thee. Ephesians, Paul gets a hold of that, that you might know the love of Christ passes knowledge. And 
and this no here in John 17, it, it's, I got to talk about it just a little bit. We've talked about it before, but it's, it's important. It's not a rational knowing. It's not an intellectual knowing. It, it means intimately, personally, to know by observation, to know by experience, and not because somebody taught you. You know it because you were there. You know it because you see it, you experience it. It means to know someone until you've entered entered them and they've entered you, you've become one. You you have entered into that knowledge and have become one with that with that knowledge. It's the word we use for marriage. These two have become one. Adam knew Eve and what happened when he knew Eve? She conceived. Had a son. It, it's knowing a person. It's having no secrets. Because why? I'm whispering in his ear. He's whispering in my ear. Right? Have no secrets. We're telling them to each other. It's, it's two persons who enter into spirit and spirit and soul to soul and body to body that do become one in every in every bit. That's the word no. This is eternal life that you might know God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ. And to have this kind of relationship guys there has to be communication. Has to be. It's the very Communication is the very definition of eternal life. You get what I'm saying? Communication. The very definition of eternal life. Two people in conversation. I mean, in any relationship, there has to be communication. I don't care if somebody... I mean, I was in the Marine Corps. I was never at war or anything. Nowadays, it's a little different. But, you know, they set up communication centers now. The World Wide Web that you have and Skype and all these things was developed for the military so they could communicate. And now people that go overseas can still communicate with their families. That's, uh, you know, what I hear them talking about uh, prisoner stuff. I was, uh, heard this guy talking today. He, he got... He was a journalist, and he got, he spent two years and eight months in Somalia. They captured him and held him for ransom. He was just a journalist, two years and eight months. Worst thing is no communication. Can't talk to your family. I mean, that's the, that's the, I mean, oh, yeah, he took the beatings and got a broke arm and hunger and all that. But the worst thing is no communication. No communication. I think in the church today, they just, they're longing for somebody, but they don't, they don't get it. That, that God is longing to, to speak to you, and He is speaking. Got to have communication. And, and so in Ephesians 3.19, uh, let me get up there. So just quote this verse here. Ephesians 3.19 And to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge. To know the love of Christ. The word I've been talking about, know, to know, that's this word right here. The two become one. To know by experience intimately. intimately. But now it says which passes knowledge. That second word here is the knowledge of reason. Okay? To know by your own experience. To know on a personal relationship. The love of, of Christ passes academic learning. This is not a study of love as a topic. This is knowing love as the person and knowing who love is in the face of Jesus Christ. In the face, intimate, whispered one another. And that's how the earliest church understood it. I don't know, but maybe you can 
you can go back and read, but there's this guy named Ananias. The Lord shows up to Ananias and says, I want you to go down to Straight Street, second house on the right. Gives him the address. You're going to be the house of Judas. I mean, the Lord just shows up to him over breakfast one morning, you know, and speaks to him. And he says, I want you to go down there, Straight Street, second house on the right, knock on the door. You'll find a guy there by the name of Saul of Tarsus, that guy you've been worried about. But don't you worry, Ananias, I've dealt with him on the road to Damascus. I want you to go in, say this and this to him, and I want you to do this to him. You know, Ananias wasn't surprised that God spoke to him. He wasn't. He didn't. He wasn't surprised God spoke to him. He was surprised that he wanted him to go talk to Paul. He's like, now hang on there, son. God. You know this guy, this Saul of Tarsus has got a letter. You know he's wrecked havoc in the church. There's conversation. That's my point. There's conversation. He wasn't surprised God was speaking to him. He was surprised at the mission. Surprised at what he said. But what does Ananias do? He goes. With just as God directed, he goes down there and meets with Saul. He says, hey, Saul, the Lord came to him. But, uh, the Lord that met you on the road to Damascus is the same Lord that showed up at breakfast to me this morning. He told me all about you. I came to do this to you to tell you this. And I mean, this is just all part and parcel of being a Christian. I mean, this is what it is. I mean, we think it's so hard, but you hear the Lord speak. And the Lord says, go here and go do this and go tell him that. And I go here and I go tell him this. And I move. What's hard about that? Ananias didn't go in there. He didn't have to have the committee meeting. He didn't have to have the church lay hands on him. He didn't have to do any of that stuff. The Lord spoke to him and he went and we get the whole New Testament. We call it Saul of Tarsus. It's amazing to me. Amazing. Just, it's all in the flow of being a Christian. Peter goes down to Cornelius' house. Cornelius, he's a daggone Italian. He gets in trouble. A Jew going down to the Gentiles. I mean, he gets in trouble. They have a big meeting up there in Jerusalem over. They got a lot of trouble going on. They have a big church meeting. What stopped the whole reprimand was, Peter says, the Spirit bade me go. Well, that's the end of that. You, you understand what I'm saying? That was it. What can we do? The Holy Spirit told him to go. I mean, they didn't say, Peter, well, you're crazy. You're hearing voices. They understood that's the way things work now. The ascended Jesus is present with us by the Holy Spirit, and he directs his church. When, when they wrote, we used to do this a lot, uh, Every Saturday, as a matter of fact, we, we call it church business. We did minutes. You know what minutes are? We take notes of the church. Well, there's one little section of church minutes recorded in the book of Acts. And at this time, they're having this big discussion over the Gentiles and what they was required of them and what they were going to do and all this other stuff. And this is what they wrote of the church minutes. It's in Acts 15. I'll just get it for you. Acts 15. Uh, I'll, I'll read two verses. 20, start at 27. We have sent therefore Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. And here's how they concluded the church business. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us. I mean, this is how they did the church work, wasn't it? Seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us. We was all in agreement. That was, that was how they did their church work. Seemed good to the Holy Ghost. Seemed good to Him, seemed good to us. You remember in Acts when they was, Paul and them, they wanted to go to Ephesus. Oh, he wanted to go to Ephesus. Holy Spirit said, no. 
Oh, well, I'm going to Bithynia. Uh, uh, Bithynia. Yeah, I want to go to Bithynia. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, but that'd be a good idea. Let's go to the Holy Spirit. And the whole future of the church hung on that no. And they heard that no, and they didn't go. He said, the Holy Spirit said no. So they end up going to Troas. And there in a dream, they see, remember it's a dream. He didn't get an email. No, he, got, he had a dream. And he sees this man from Macedonia saying, come help us. Remember that? And by that very thing, the gospel came to Europe. Because they didn't want to go there. People heard God speak and they were led and directed. Remember, we read that, acknowledge Him in all your ways. He would direct our paths. The Holy Spirit will speak to you. You'll, it seemed good to go to Ephesus. I mean, this is a thriving church. Man. I don't want to go down it. No. Want to go to Pitt then? Then we're going somewhere. No. We'll go to Troas. And nothing's going on here, but I had a dream. Man down in Macedonia said, Come and help us. Ah, there, there we go. I know a lot of people, uh, especially the charismatic side, they seem to view the Holy Spirit as a power, as an anointing. You, you know what I mean? I mean we've used all those words. And, Yes, the Holy Spirit is power, and yes, the Holy Spirit is anointing. But the Holy Spirit is a person. Yes. Amen. The Holy Spirit is a person. He's all those other things, but never ever. The first and foremost, he's a person because I can't have a relationship with the power. That's right. That's right. I can't have a relationship with an anointing. I can't have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. I, the, the scripture, Paul said, grieve not the Holy Spirit. I can't grieve a power. You, you know what I mean? I might grieve the state of Virginia. And I'll get a lawyer and we'll hash it out. But I grieve Tracy. I have. They're a plumb man. Now why is that? Because there's a relationship. There's love involved. The entire Bible says that, I mean, this whole thing is a relationship. I mean, you know, I thought this was... You know, Bible's a road map to give me to heaven. God's over yonder and he gave me some instructions, some real hard ones, as a matter of fact, because when I read it here, I can't do it, Joe. There ain't a one of them commandments I can do. I've searched them out. I thought, well, honor thy father and my mother. That'd be a good one. I got great parents. Do. Tell dad, tell him to get up and go feed the cows. I got to go to school. I ain't got time to do that. Who does he think he is? I got important stuff to do. See, I blew it. I blew it. And, and I read in the Bible that if I broke one, I broke them all. So I just found that I can't do it. So, roadmap to heaven, I'm out. This thing ain't about a roadmap to heaven. It's about a relationship. And in that relationship is conversation. The entire Bible says that we're called to conversation. We're called to dialogue with the Holy Trinity. That's the heart of what Christianity is. That's why his house is a house of prayer. Isn't it? It's a house of prayer. Why not call it a, I mean, a great song with Led Zeppelin, Stairway to Heaven. Why not call it the Stairway to Heaven? Oh, we got people out here preaching Jacob's Ladder and everything else. If you'll do this, you climb up higher and you'll get there and all this he didn't say this, come to the church, it's a stairway to heaven. He said, it's a house of prayer. House of prayer, that's what you've been called to. You've been called into divine conversation. That's what you've been called into, so he can whisper in your ear. He can whisper in your ear. I've heard him whisper in my ear before. It said, Joe, five. You can tell who's, who, you can tell who's hearing and who's not. You can, you can tell there's a difference. That's what Christianity is, to know God. This is eternal life. To as many as what? Hear the voice of God. They shall hear and they shall live. They shall come out of their graves. They shall come out of that old man of death and hear. They shall, they shall come out of that and they shall live. I mean, we know a type and shadow of a dead man, Lazarus, heard the voice of God. He heard the voice that said, 
Lazarus come forward and he heard it. He heeded that voice. I don't know how he got to the door. I don't know if the angels carried him. He was wrapped up like a mummy. I don't know. But he heard. And, and, and we know him in the face of Jesus Christ. It's face-to-face -face relationship. And the church has drifted so far away, so far away from that, that it's, it's scary. Millions and millions of believers know all about Jesus, but they've never heard His voice. There, there's a verse here. This verse blows my mind. You, you'll get Second Samuel. Just one little verse. 2 Samuel, chapter 14, verse 28. So Absalom dwelt two full years in Jerusalem and saw not the king's face. Well, we know we've come to Mount Zion. We know, speaking of New Jerusalem, we're speaking of the church, the body of Christ, Many have, many live and dwell in the presence of Jesus. Many live in Mount Zion. Many live in New Jerusalem and have never heard the voice of God, has never saw the king's face. Living right there. And I, I love it about this, this, this king, and we, we'll see in a minute, that this king... I, I, I mean, I don't know how you would, could really say it. I, I, I have to be careful here because I, I want to say that it's a movable throne because in the Old Covenant, uh, the king sat here, okay, and you went to the king, right? I mean, that's how it was. The king, he lives over there. That's his house. Solomon built his house. The king lives up there. So if I want an audience with the king, you know, I got to, I'm over here. I've got to make this journey to Jerusalem. Well, somehow... This good shepherd here that I was lost didn't give me a rug bed, came and brought me back. I mean, that's one way to look at it. He carried me into the presence of the king. Another way to look at it is the king came to me, came where I am. He desired, listen, if the king is over there and I've got to make the journey over there, then it's my desire to speak with him, not his desire to speak to me. You get what I'm saying? Okay, I'm, I'm here. I'm not going anywhere, okay? If you want to talk to me, you got to come over here. That means your desire to talk to me is greater than my desire to talk to you. You with me on that? God has come to you. You understand what I'm saying, Joe? God has came to you. He's not waiting on you. He came to you because that's how much he desires to talk to you. He pursued us. He's not sitting up there and, okay, you know, okay, Joe's turn. No. He sought us out. Seeks us out. And here is Absalom living in the presence of a king. Guess who his dad is? Guess who your father is? I mean, this is type of chatting with him. Absalom, my son, my son. Guess who you are? You are sons and daughters of the living God. And many of them don't believe it's even possible to hear the voice of God. I mean, i got to ask myself, why is that? I mean, why is that so that, that, that this came into the church? And what do we have to do in order to combat that and return to the way things were in the early church. In the early church, they, they listened to the living presence of the ascended Jesus, His Spirit, speaking His love words to us. We'll, we'll talk more about that, but I want, to, I want to show you something here. Revelation chapter 3. And first, let me make a disclaimer. These seven churches that Jesus wrote to are, is not seven church ages. You'll find these churches all around, okay, in every age, if you want to call it that. So don't look at these churches as seven church ages. They're, they're not. 
If they was, then we just well throw the other six out because everybody's got us living in the lay of the sea and age. And if that's the case, no need to preach to me, return to thy first love, because that's already passed. But that's not the way it is. Revelation 3 and 14, and unto the angel of the church of Laodicea write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. What magnificent words. I know thy works. And you know thou art neither hot nor cold. I would you were hot or cold. But because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I'll spew thee out of my mouth. I, that, that, I mean, that's a strong word. That's a vomit. It's a, it's a word of, of disgust. He's disgusted with this church. Think about this. He's disgusted. I mean, he's telling us. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest thou not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked? Don't y'all know anything, church? I mean, come on. Tell me you ain't need of nothing. And, and listen to these words. I counsel thee. He didn't say, I demand of thee right now. Worship me. I counsel Jesus in his humility, I'm coming to you with mighty counsel, church, that, that makes me sick to my stomach, that makes me want to puke. I'm counseling to buy of me gold tried in the fire that you may be rich. My desire is for you to be rich and white raiment that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness do not appear, and anoint your eyes with eye sap that you may see. That's, my, that's his desire for a church that makes him want to puke. Think about that, guys. A church that makes Jesus want to puke. His desire is a counsel of thee to bow me. And, and look at verse 19. As, I mean, he tells us why here. As many as I love, I rebuke and chase. As many as I love. What's he saying to the church of Laodicea who makes him want to puke? I love you. Because I love you, I've come to you. And I'm counseling you. I'm, I'm begging you. I rebuke and I chase and be zealous therefore and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock and any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come into him and sup with him and he with me to him that overcometh I'll grant to sit with me in my throne even as I also overcame and have sat down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. A lot of people will take these verses right here and say all Jesus standing at the door knocking. They look out at the sinners out there in the world and say, Jesus standing at your door. Uh -uh. This is the church. This is a letter to the church at Laodicea. Let's never forget that. Church at Laodicea. And guys, I don't know if you know that, notice this, but he says, behold, I stand at the door knock. Who's on the outside of the door? Knock. I mean, it's Jesus. But it's not the little Jesus standing there in a purple robe with a crown of thorns on. Uh-uh. Let me describe the Jesus. Now, now imagine this. Here we are, up here on Wednesday night, having church. And all of a sudden, and we hear the we hear the the, the song singing from 50 miles away, and the voice is so loud and so loud and so loud. Light fills the whole room, beaming through every crack that there is. This is 
And we go and look at the door here, and here's somebody standing at the door, and this is what he looks looks like, standing at the door knocking. I saw one likening it to the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his foot, girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head, his hairs were like white, like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were a flame of fire. His feet like the fine brass as if they burned in a furnace. His voice, the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. His countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell, and his feet is dead. Yeah. Now, just a little while ago, and I don't know, it's a few years ago, but John, 16-year-old John, who wrote this, said up there in the upper room, Jesus, his best friend, laid his head over on Jesus' bosom right here. Jesus' is best buddy had something together, you know, walked together and talked together. You know, Jesus, the best... This wasn't the same Jesus knocking on the door. This, when John saw this Jesus standing there, he said that when I saw him, I fell on my feet as dead. He had to pick me up. He laid his hand over the first words out of his mouth was, John, it's me. I mean, that's what Jesus said, it's me. John, it's me, your friend. Fear not, John. Can you imagine? I don't know how you read the Bible, but I'm just taking it back. So here is a church at Laodicea, and it's this Jesus standing at the door knocking. This Jesus right here. Not the guy in the purple robe. This Jesus with eyes of fire and white bull and golden girdle and, and all of this that we follow. We don't want him in the church. You, you understand what I'm saying? Then he says, he says, behold, behold. I mean, how in the world could this Jesus be excluded from the church meeting? It's why we have a church meeting. And we want to exclude him from it. He's excluded from the gathering? And what does he do? He stands at the door and knocks. Because he loves his church. He loves his church. That, that word behold there means to stand in awe and stand in, in wonder. Like, can you believe this? Is this really true? Is that who it really is? I mean, this Jesus is saying, behold, I, the ascended Jesus, the glorified Christ, stand at the door and knock. Notice he doesn't gate crash. If you don't want him in your church service, he won't be here. He desires to be here. He desires with it. He died to be here. But if you don't want him in, he won't get crash. People don't want him in their lives. He won't come and, 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 and you know, he won't get crash. You don't want him in your business. You don't want him in your work, in your family. He won't get crash. But, oh, he's standing there knocking. I mean, He appeared in the upper room. Remember after his resurrection? Doors locked. He just appears in the upper room. But now he chooses to stand outside. He stands outside the door of the Laodicean church. And, it, and he knocks. It's, it's humility of love. This is this all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And yet he won't kick in the door. He stands outside and knocks. I mean, he doesn't dictate. He doesn't force. And the desire, behold, I stand at the door and knock. I mean, he's standing at the door. Behold, I, he said, behold, it's me, guys. It's me. It's me. It's me, Jesus. I, I know I'm king of kings, but it's me, the man, Christ Jesus. It's me. It's me, Patty. It's me. I mean, don't you know me? It's me, guys. Come on, let me in. I mean, I see, I see it like a teenager there, you know, like, hey, no, I know you're in there. Let me in. I don't want you in there. We got our own thing going. We don't need nothing. We don't need you. He 
He longs for us. He yearns for us. I don't believe we've ever understood how much that He longs for us, that, it, that He yearns for us. I mean, the reason of our existence, that, the reason of creation, that, that God would let you know His love, that you would respond to that love, and out of that love relationship and love fellowship, there would come, that, that, that out of that you would do whatever it is that you do in, in life. And we don't get that. I still think I, I still have the picture. That's why I wanted to explain to you. I still have the picture of Jesus over here and me over there, and I've got to come to Him. I still don't get the picture in my head over and over that He stands at my door and knocks, and He's ever chasing me down. Let me in. Let me in. I want to be, I want to be in your business. I want to be in everything. That you, I want to do this with you. Yes. I heard the story of this mother... Her, her baby boy was born and then during the birth he got severe brain damage. And so he was unresponsive. So she ended up taking care of him. The boy, just like a vegetable, you know, could do nothing. Just went around. Never responded one time. He's 46 years old. And this lady, she was telling Malcolm, I talked to Malcolm, he said, because we don't, we don't get it. And she said one day she had him out in the park and, and she just overwhelmed with love for him and she just hugged him up and squeezed him so tight. And, and she said, if only you knew how much I love you. And, and you know, the boy never responded. Never responded. And she said in that moment, Jesus spoke to her plain as day. It said, if only you knew how much I love you. When, when I hear this Laodicean church, you know what I'm thinking of Laodicean church? I'm like, Jesus, forget them. Knuckleheads don't want you in. Get rid of them. Start a new one, right? Get, a, get rid of them. They don't want, I mean, don't stand out there and at the door and let them, just let them go. Why bother? Why stand at the door and knock? I mean, Jesus is saying, I might be disgusted with you that the things that you're doing make me want to puke, but my love will not leave you. I will never leave you. And if any man will just hear my voice, if any one of y'all in there, if anybody in that church will just hear me, come crack the door, just let me in, I'll stay in the back. You know, it don't matter. I just want to be in there with you. This is holy passion. Holy passion that's longing for you. God wants us. He desires us. I mean, it's pictured all through scriptures, all that as a relentless pursuit. Pursuit of us, desiring us in infinite patience and long suffering because the, there's only one thing on God's agenda, and that is fellowship with you. Hear me. Only one thing on God's agenda, and that is the fellowship with you. He came here for that very thing. I mean, we. What do you think God's agenda is? We think, I mean, most people in the church think God's agenda is build him another church. Or some, do some kind of service for him. you got to go do something, you know, you come into the church and you can get, get in all these committees, you can do, go do this, you got to serve God, and this is what God's agenda is. God's agenda is be whole. I mean, here's his agenda summed up right here. I stand at the door and knock. It's me. It's, it's Jesus. I'm standing at the door. God longs. Watch his longing. He says right here, If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and sup with him. It's, it's dine with him. This is God's desire. God's desire for his church is to have supper with him. I mean, think about it. I thought he wanted us to go on a mission trip. Well, that's good. I'm not doing it right with mission trips. I mean, well, what is his desire? To build me a church? No, he builds a church. He builds the church. It's his church. He added to the church daily such as should be saved. Who asked? You? Me? Forget it. He adds to the church. He builds the church. He is the church. He upholds the church. He's the rock the church is built on. He's the capstone of the church. He's it. He's the life of the church. 
Quit worrying about the church. And that's a word for me. It's all right. It's in his hands. He's got it. You with me? His desire is dinner. Jesus desires to come where you are and have dinner because that's what he did. He said, Leo, to see a church, y'all need to find me and y'all need to seek me out and y'all need to get back on the right path, the path of righteousness and holiness and start keeping the law. He said, I'm right here. Y'all make me want to puke, but my desire is to come in anyway and have dinner with you. Now, he didn't say, I want to have coffee with you. You know, got 15 minutes, we'll go have a cup of coffee. You know, I, I want to have lunch with you. How long you get? 30 minutes? Okay, let's go have lunch in 30 minutes. I want to come into that evening meal, that meal that starts about 6 o'clock, ends about 1 or 2 in the morning, where we just sit around and relax and we talk. It's that evening meal that's long and fellowship and interaction. It's exposure of one person to another. And it's coming to know another person. Interaction. Here's a, here's a little point I want to be done. Do you know you don't invite somebody to dinner you don't like? Think about that. I mean, have you ever said, you know what, I don't like you, but I want to have it? Uh -uh. I don't like you, I don't want you to come to my house. <laughs> right? I mean, I'm just being common sense. So what does that mean? Not only does he love you, he likes you. Not only does he love you, he likes you. So much that he wants to have the evening meal with you. And that evening meal where, where you sit around and, and you relax around each other and you can let your hair down and you come out of your shell and, and, and you know, it's okay. I'm, I'm safe around you. and it's, it's okay if I, you know, I discover who you are in this meal, and you discover who I am. And, I mean, this whole thing, what we've been, how to uh, uh, discover your destiny, same thing what we're talking about here, how to hear the voice of God, because it's a journey. It's a safari into the heart of God. That's what it is. It's a, it's a journey. It's to know Him. That's what it's all about. Oh, <laughs>